Today we start to utilize what we have learned previously to help us select the diameter of a shaft. So this is the first component we're going to deal with. There's lots of other components that we will cover this quarter, but this is the first one. This problem is a simple example out of the book. It is in English units, unfortunately, so all the dimensions are in inches. And we have in this case a shaft that is aligned with the x-axis, and there are two gears on the shaft, a gear at A and a gear over here at C. C. A force is applied to the gear at A, and the magnitude of that force is 600 pounds. Our first task is to estimate the force that's required at gear C to keep this shaft in dynamic equilibrium. Now, it will be spinning, but it will not be accelerating, so it's in dynamic equilibrium. And that means that the torque generated by the force of 600 pounds at A is going to be equal in magnitude to the torque generated by the gear tooth force applied at C. So these will be equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign. So right off the bat, what we have to do is determine the magnitude of the force components that are acting, or we can just go straight to the torques. What we need to do to calculate the torque that is generated by the two force at A is we need the tangential component of that force, which is simply going to be FA times the cosine of 20 degrees. That force will be acting through a moment arm that goes to the center of the shaft, and that moment arm will have a distance that is equal to one half the shaft diameter, so it's gonna be 12 inches. Over at gear C, we have the same problem, and that is we need the tangential component of the tooth force at C, so we need FC cosine 20 degrees acting about the center of the shaft through a distance of half the diameter or five inches. So what we have here then is relatively straightforward and let's go to the first page of our lecture notes. It says find the torque that's acting about the shaft due to gear A. So we have that FA times cosine 20 degrees times 12 inches is going to be equal to FC times cosine of 20 degrees times its moment arm, which is five inches. That says that FC is going to be equal to, while well, we cancel the cosines, FC is 12 fifths of FA, and we know that FA is 600 pounds, so that FC is simply going to be equal to 1,440 pounds. Now, the other thing that we want to do, I jumped ahead, actually, I found, I answered question two already. The other thing that we want to do is calculate the torque, so I'm going to flip these around, and the torque is simply going to be FA, which is 600 pounds times the cosine of 20 degrees times 12 inches, and that is going to be 6,766 inch pounds. Now, if you look carefully back at the diagram up here, you'll notice that this torque is trying to rotate gear A in that direction, and the torque it generated by the tooth force at C is trying to rotate gear C in the opposite direction. And so it turns out we have equal and opposite torques. And by the right hand rule, that torque could be written as a vector. So the torque at A as a vector would simply be minus 6,766 I inch pounds, and the torque at the center of the shaft at C would just be equal to positive 6,766 I inch pounds. So the torque exists in the shaft between the two gears. The other thing that we have to consider is the reactions that are occurring at the bearings at section O and B. So let's go back to the drawing briefly. We have a bearing at O and we have a bearing at B. We're just going to imagine that we're locating the centers of action of the bearings, just like we were looking at the centers of actions of the gears, and we didn't worry about the face width of the gear. We're not going to worry right now about the width of the bearings at O or B. We're just going to locate the average reaction force at the center of that bearing width. So the first thing that we are going to do is we're going to write the force that's generated by the tooth force at A and the tooth force at C as vectors. We're going to move those forces to the center of the shaft, and as we move them to the center of the shaft, we know that that generates a torque. So the force at A is simply going to be equal to the magnitude of the force at A 
times a cosine of 20 degrees and that's going to be that's going to be pointing in the y direction and that means this is a j component and then we're also going to have a radial force acting that passes through the axis but it's pointing in the neg negative z direction so it is fa times the sine of 20 degrees k is simply equal to 564 pound force j minus 205 pound force k. So I just put the unit indicator over there. Likewise, we can take the force magnitude that we figured out at C and we can turn that into a vector. So the force that's acting at C, if we go through the same sort of work, is just minus 492J plus 1353K. That's in units of pound force. The other thing that I want to do, since I'm writing these gear tooth forces as vectors, I'm going to write the reaction force at O as a Y component, R-O-Y-J plus R-O-Z-K, and that at bearing B is going to be R-B-Y-J plus R-B-Z-K. So we wrote the reaction forces as vectors as well. Now we got to go back and look at that drawing because I have left something out and that is I've included the BY component, the RBZ component, the ROY and the ROZ, but I neglected an X component in each of those bearings. I did that because there are no forces acting in the X direction, but it is important for you to know that we usually look for one of the bearings to carry the x-directed load, even though there may be some sharing of that load between the bearings. So we have tooth force as vectors. We have the reaction force also as vectors. And so now what we want to do is we want to take the sum of the moments about, let's say, O. If we take the sum of the moments about O, the reaction force at O will not play a role, and so we don't have to worry about it. We're going to say that the sum of the moments are equal to zero because this thing is in static equilibrium. What it does is it allows us to write a moment equation. So the sum of the moments about O is going to be given by cross products of the vector, the location vector R. O A, and that is the vector that goes from O to the forces that are acting at the center of the shaft at A. So I'm gonna cross that into the tooth force that's acting at A. I'm gonna take R, O, B, that is the distance from O to the bearing at B. I'm gonna cross that into the reaction vector at B. And I'm gonna to add to that R, O, C, that's the distance vector out to the gear tooth force at C. And I'm gonna cross that into FC. So what you'll notice, some of the moments being equal to zero, we break that into components. So we can then look at the Z component, the sum of the Z component moments equal to zero, and some of the Y component moments equal to zero. That allows us to solve for R, B, Y, and R, B, Z. That makes our life a little bit simpler. If we do that, we find that RB is simply given by 315 pound force J minus 1615 pound force K. Now, if you thought you weren't gonna have to do statics, you thought wrong. You gotta do statics the rest of your engineering careers because statics and free body diagrams is the way you figure out the loads that your system must carry. When we take, once we have the reaction at B, we can take some of the forces being equal to zero to find the reaction at O. And if we do that, we find that it's minus 387 J plus 467 K, again, in units of pound force. Now that we have all of the forces that are acting on the shaft, we can find the bending moments as a function of location along the shaft. So what I'm going to do is imagine a drawing of that shaft. I align the shaft with the x-axis and I have y and z axes as shown. And I know that I have my reaction forces at O acting. So I have minus 387 acting downward. I have a 467 acting in the positive z direction, those are pound forces. 20 inches to the right, 
I have the forces associated with the gear at A, and those forces include a minus 205 pound Z-directed force and a positive 564 pound Y-directed force. And as I mentioned before, we're also going to have a torque and that torque has a magnitude of 6766 inch-pounds. I don't have enough room to write all these units, so you're going to have to forgive me on that. It's 16 inches further along the shaft, we have the bearing reaction forces at B, and those bearing reaction forces are 315 pound force acting in the Y direction and a minus 1615 pound force acting in the negative direction. Z direction and another 10 inches off to the right. We have the forces associated with the gear at C. We have 492 pounds down and 1353 in the Z direction. So that means we have bending in two planes. We have bending in the XY and XZ planes. So bending in the XY plane is really a moment about the Z axis and bending in the XZ plane is a moment about the Y axis. So we have two bending moments that are associated with this. And now what we want to do is sort out what the bending moments are as we move along the shaft. And the reason we care about that is we have to we have to understand where the maximum bending moment is relative to all the components. And it's because we are going to locate the components on the shaft using shoulders along the shaft. So for instance, as we move along the shaft, let's just take a look down in the YZ plane, we would have the bearing at O, which would be pressed up against the shoulder, gear at A, which would likely be pressed up against the shoulder. Then we would have the bearing at B, which would be pressed up against the shoulder. And then we would likely have the gear at C pressed up against the shoulder. So all of these shoulders generate stress concentration factors. We'll get to those in a moment, but there's also forces associated, the reaction forces at O, the gear forces at A, the reaction forces at B, the gear forces at C. We're going to presume that all of those things happen in the center of the location where the component is pressed onto the shaft. And we need to know the moments that are acting at those locations. But more importantly, we need to know the moments that are acting at these shoulders because these shoulders generate stress concentration factors, and it's likely that those shoulders will be the places of highest stress. We are trying to find our shaft diameters. We're trying to find the smaller diameter associated with a local stress state. This is our goal, to find the base shaft diameter and then build the shoulders on top of it. And the way we're gonna find that base shaft diameter is we're gonna locate the location of highest stress and then calculate what the diameter must be in order for us to have an infinite fatigue life. So the goal is to find D for the location of highest stress to assure infinite fatigue life. Right, so how the heck are we going to do that? Well, what we need to do is we need to write an equation for the moment about the Z and Y axes. We wanna write a general equation as a function of X along the shaft, and then we need to find the net moment by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of that moment at each location x. So we're really looking for these things as functions of x. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the way I like to do it is I like to use singularity functions, and then I put those singularity functions into a spreadsheet. If we want the moment about the z-axis, we'll be looking in the yz plane. So if you look carefully in the yz plane, we're gonna start off with an equation that looks like this. We have minus 387 pound force multiplied by the distance x. So what we're doing is we're coming along here in the, in the direction x. We section the shaft at any location x, and we say, what's the moment? What is the moment that we need? Once we pass the point A where the gear to gear A is acting, we have to include the force of gear A. It's pointing in, the diff in an opposite direction, so it's going to have an opposite sign. We have to multiply it by a moment arm. The moment arm is our x location minus the location where 
that force is acting. So it's 20 inches. And I'm using these, these angled brackets. So the moment arm is x minus 20 with angled brackets. And the angle simply tells me that I do not turn this term on until I exceed 20 inches. Next, along the, the way, we have this 315 pound acting at x minus 36 to the first power. And then, of course, we would have the force of the gear C out there at the end. But since X never goes beyond the end of the shaft, we don't even have to include that in the moment equation. Now we got to do the same thing for the moment about the Y axis, where we're going to have 467 pounds times X minus 205 times the quantity X minus 20 raised to the first power minus... 1615 x minus 36 raised to the first power. Those give me general expressions for the moments about the y and the z axes that I can program into an Excel spreadsheet and calculate the net moment. We just showed that you can use singularity functions to write the moment as a function of location along the shaft. And I have taken those singularity functions and inserted them into an Excel spreadsheet, which I am showing here. The X column, column A, goes from X equals zero all the way down to 46 inches, the location of the rightmost gear on the shaft. For each of those locations, I use the moment equation, the singularity function equation, to determine what the moment is as a function of location x. So the moment about the z-axis is in column b. The moment about the y-axis is in column c. The square root of the sum of the squares of each moment at each location is in column d. In the end, I make a plot of the net moment as a function of location along the shaft. And this is in units of inch-pounds. And we see that it starts at zero, as it should, because the bearing at the left end supports no moment. It rises up until we hit the force at gear A. It continues to rise until we reach the bearing at B, and then it drops off to zero at the end of the shaft, as it should. So if you're ever writing these and you see that the net moment doesn't start and end at zero whenever you don't have an applied moment at the ends of the shaft, you know it has to come to zero. So you made a mistake if it doesn't end at zero under those circumstances. So the important thing here is I have to enter those singularity function equations. So let's just take a look at this entry right here. Uh, in column B, the moment about the z-axis I have an equation up here. I have this equation up here, and this is what it looks like. I have the force that's applied at the bearing at position O on the shaft. I have minus 387. I'm multiplying that by the x variable, which is in column A. And then I add to that as I move to the right of the shaft. I have the 564 pound force that is acting at x minus 20 inches. And I have to multiply that by a function that turns this entire thing on only if the x value is greater than 20. Hopefully you can see that. So this is the singularity function part. You have the, the x minus 20 multiplied by is x greater than 20. And if x is greater than 20, then this value is 1. If it's less than 20, this value is zero. So it turns that term off. I keep moving along the right side and I come to the reaction at bearing B, 315 pounds times X minus 36, multiplied by the function A2 X greater than 36, which turns that last term on. So that's the very simple way of writing these singularity equations. I did that for both Y and Z directed components. And when you do that, you end up with this rather beautiful net moment plot that shows me that my net moment is greatest at point 36. That's position 36. That is the center of bearing B as I move along the shaft. So that's the place that I care about. That's the moment that I'm going to use.
I'm going to use that moment. I know that I have torsion between gear A and gear C. And so at this point, I'm going to have bending moment at position 36. And I'm going to have torsion. That's what I will throw into the equations to determine the diameter of the shaft. Right, so now that you've seen how to use an Excel spreadsheet to calculate the net moments, we have identified the location of maximum bending moment, and it turns out to be at bearing B. Now we have another problem. If we are going to use shoulders to locate all of the components, I don't know what the stress concentration factor is because I don't know the difference in diameter across that shoulder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use table 7-1, which is an estimation of stress concentration factors for various commonly occurring shoulder fillets, key sets, and retaining ring grooves. And the, in order to play it safe, as we make our calculations, I'm going to go ahead and imagine the sharp fillet radius and the higher stress concentration factors. So I'm going to use for bending an elastic stress concentration factor of 2.7. And for torsion, I'm going to use an elastic stress concentration factor of 2.2. Now look, if we have a retaining ring, look at how high these stress concentration factors get. Five and three, those are large stress concentration factors. Uh, but otherwise, we would use these stress concentration factors associated with the shoulders. What we're trying to do is a hand calculation to enable a first estimate of the shaft size. We would then CAD that shaft up. We would run a finite element analysis on that shaft and see what our factor of safety is for infinite life. And if it's an excessively large factor of safety, we can decrease the diameter of the shaft calculate again what the factor of safety is, and then we can go through an optimization process to find the exact shaft size that we would want for our given application. Keep in mind, however, that you're also always going to have to buy the shaft, and so you're going to want to minimize your costs. You might decide to buy something a little bit bigger just because it was cheaper. So don't worry too much about those issues. For now, what I'm trying to teach you is how you can take the information that you have, estimate stress concentration factors, and extract a shaft diameter. Now, what we do know, by the way, is that the bending stresses, so the bending stress is always given by a bending moment times a distance from the neutral axis to the outermost fibers divided by I, where I is the moment of inertia. For circular shafts of circular cross-section, C would be equal to D over 2, and I would be pi D to the fourth over 64. So this bending stress is just going to be equal to 32M over pi D cubed when you input these things into that bending equation. Of course, we then would multiply it by a stress concentration factor, Kt, which would magnify the, amp the magnitude of that stress. The other thing that we have to consider is we might have torsion acting. I've already mentioned that we are going to have torsion acting between gear A and gear C. And so the shear stress from torque is a T r over j term, and it's going to have a shear stress concentration factor because we're going to be calculating it at a shoulder. If we put in the j, the polar moment of inertia, we end up with the shear stress being equal to 16t over pi d cubed multiplied by that stress concentration factor. So those are the two stresses that we care about for circular shafts subjected to bending and torsion. Now, because we have two different stresses, we have to combine those stresses into a single equivalent uniaxial using a von Mises equation. And the von Mises equation simply says that the stress is going to be equal to the bending stress squared plus three times the shear stress squared, all square root of all of that. Next step. When we have rotating bending problem, we may have to calculate an equivalent uniaxial stress amplitude and an equivalent 
uniaxial mean stress. The way we get at those is again we use a von Mises equation where we identify the amplitude of the bending moment, the amplitude of the torsion, the mean bending moment, and the mean torsion. We can calculate these stress concentration factors for fatigue using this equation here and the notch sensitivity. It's a huge process. There is nothing wrong with assuming we can let Kf equal Kt, the elastic stress concentration factor, and all that will do is raise the magnitude of the stress and it will be a conservative answer then because we will be slightly overestimating the stress amplitude and the mean stress. But there are ways for you to set up an Excel spreadsheet and calculate, this is this Neuber length scale, use that given your fillet radius to calculate the notch sensitivity. And from that stuff, you can calculate the fatigue stress concentration factor. So it's all doable. I just don't know that there's a lot to be gained by doing it right now. Okay, so here's the other deal that we have. We have both bending stress and torsional stress acting. We've already looked at the Excel spreadsheet and we know our worst case bending stress is at bearing B. We know that we have shear acting at bearing B. And furthermore, we know that the, we know that the moment amplitude is just equal to the maximum moment we calculate at bearing B, that if we are operating at steady state, the torque amplitude is zero and the entire torque appears as a mean stress, and the mean stress for the bending moment is zero because it's fully reversed bending. So this equation reduces to a much simpler form, and our stress amplitude and our mean stresses are rather easily calculated for this particular case. But once we have those stress amplitudes and mean stresses, you know that we gotta convert those into an equivalent stress using a mean stress correction factor. And the mean stress correction factors that we have, where we plot stress amplitude against mean stress, are shown here. The one that I have a tendency to use a lot is the Goodman equation, a simple straight line that connects the endurance limit to the ultimate tensile strength. It's a somewhat conservative uh, criterion. It's the easiest to understand. There's Gerber's parabola, which is parabolically connecting the endurance strength to the ultimate tensile strength. There is ASME elliptic, which identifies the yield strength as an important point. So ASME elliptic is more conservative than the Gerber parabola because it lies inside of it. And then there's the super conservative Soderberg line, which draws a straight line from endurance to the yield strength. We can use any one of those criteria we want. It would slightly change the fatigue factor of safety. So if we use the Goodman straight line equation, we need to calculate our stress, our equivalent von Mises stress amplitude, our equivalent mean stress, and we need to know our endurance limit and our ultimate tensile strength. So SUT is a material property, whereas the endurance strength is estimated using the ultimate tensile strength and Marin factors. Now if we plug the equations up here, these equivalent stress equations, 7, 5, and 7, 6, if we plug those into this Goodman equation, we get this equation right here, 7, 7, which is the most general equation that allows you to relate your bending moments and your torques. If you know your endurance limit, you know your material, so you know the ultimate tensile strength. And if you knew the diameter, you could calculate the fatigue factor of safety. If you specified as fatigue factor of safety, you could flip it around and estimate the diameter. This is what we are trying to do. Come up with a first estimate of the shaft diameter for a given factor of safety against fatigue in known loading state. So the only rub for you is you gotta calculate net moments. You gotta determine if you have moment amplitudes and mean stress, moment means. You have to calculate torques and determine if you have a torque amplitude and a mean torque. You have to, for your given shaft material, look up the ultimate tensile strength. And you have to calculate the endurance limit based upon that ultimate tensile strength 
and using the Marin factors, you're going to estimate what the endurance strength, what the endurance limit would be. Now, remember, the Marin factors include a geometric size correction factor, which you can't determine until you have D. So you might as well just let that correction factor be equal to one. So don't, don't make your life harder than it needs to be. And that is your task in this week's assignment.